This morning's guest will be painless. Meet him. Coming up next on Carolina People. Good morning. Welcome to Carolina People. This morning we're in the Harry Hartshorn Reading Room of the Elizabeth Maddox Chapin Library on the Grand Strand campus of Ori Georgetown Technical College. We're focused on medicine and we're visiting with the Director of Medical Affairs at Grand Strand Regional Medical Center, Dr. John Charles. Good morning, Dr. Charles. This is a long Greg. stretch even for us at 7 a.m. Yeah, uh, we're lucky we're, over uh, here. We've got, you know, 44 inch. Uh, uh, <laughs> a little bit extra, yeah. that's right. I think yours yeah. is a little farther than mine. Maybe. A little farther than mine. Well, I'm and happy to be here. Thanks for for having me on. Even more exciting, the library doesn't open for another 45 minutes, but uh, they gave us the opportunity to get in a little early, and I think it was very cool you saw something of a familiar uh, side when you walked into the library right. this morning. Right. The, the first thing I saw when I walked in, Greg, was uh, a, a portrait of uh, Elizabeth uh, Maddox Chapin, and um, even from across the room I recognized it as one of my mother's mm -hmm. portraits. and. Um, she was a, a portrait artist and has done quite a few uh, portraits like that um, right. of historical figures uh, off of uh, sets of photographs and uh, they're hanging in various libraries and, and lobbies and things of that nature. Sure. And I had never seen this one before but I, I recognized it just as her work. And then you uh, verified that coming up yeah. a little closer and seeing her right. initials and your last name there. You bet. On there, even more in, in an additional exciting aspect here on the wall there behind our director is a portrait of Harry Hartshorn, right? Who's a close friend of your uh, dad's, I believe, and involved right. with Harry Love and your dad and helping to right. establish the uh, right. Harry Harry Hartshorn um, and Harry Love and my father who's also named Harry, right. um, were instrumental in um, putting together the funding uh, for the um, Burroughs and Chapin uh, Spring Made Villa Art Museum. Right. Uh, so we're very proud of that. Absolutely. A beautiful facility there. And they had that party uh, last year, a couple of years ago, to honor the three Harrys. Right. As a great reminder that it takes a lot of dedicated volunteers like those three guys yeah. and so many others the Chapin Foundation and groups that really make it happen to make right. something like that uh, come together. And, and it was an interesting thing. Uh, th there was a stretch of several years where, you know, the the building was in decay and no nothing was going anywhere, and it really re required from those those three uh, a lot of perseverance and um, uh, and a sense of not giving up. Right. Uh, when, right. when it looked grim. Absolutely. Those early years, we heard about it that night at that celebration. John, about yourself, are you originally from the Myrtle Beach area? No, uh, Greg, I was born in Florence. Oh, good. But my dad was in the military. He was, he was, a, he was born and raised in Florence, but joined the military as a JAG officer in the Air Force. Right. And so um, I did not grow up in the PD. I was just born there. And um, when I finished my military service, um, 18 years ago, uh, we moved here, and uh, my parents had been living here for about 15 years at that time. Right, since '74, you said. Right. Yeah. Am I correct that you married a, a, a Florence area native as yeah. well? Yeah, yeah. This is very unusual. You know, you you're born in one town, and then you grow up in France and Japan and New Jersey and all these places. <laughs> the last thing you anticipate is to marry uh, the daughter of one of your dad's high school friends. <laughs> so it was a, that's very uh, an odd coincidence. But, yeah. uh, uh, my father's, I mean, my father-in-law is Ed Young. Right, of course, sure. One of our congressmen uh, back in the early 70s. And uh, I was in college, and my dad called me up and said, you know, Ed Young is up here, and, and he's coming out to our house for dinner. Once a um, once a week because they were living in Washington. My uh, parents were. Uh -huh. And uh, I want you to to go ahead and uh, he's got a daughter just your age and she's going to your college and I want you to call her up and take her out. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I said, well, bad chance of that. You know, <laughs> I choose my own dates. Oh know? yeah. I'm not going to go on an obligatory date. Right. So I, I ignored his. He he called several times. I ignored it and then. I went home to Washington for the summer and, and worked a construction job, what I usually did. And one day I was sitting out on the front porch uh, before supper, and my dad pulls up and 
um, out steps this gorgeous young lady who stole my heart immediately. Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, and um, she had gone up there to work the summer as well, and so my dad had surreptitiously gone and snatched her and uh, brought her out for dinner. I love it. Without warning anybody. Sounds like my dad. That's great. Yeah. Yes, without any warning. Yeah. yeah, even better. Caught me by surprise. Even better. And it's worked out into a long uh, a long, t long marriage there. And, of course, you all are now the parents of three, uh, proud parents of three. Yeah. Yeah, wonderful kids. I, I don't know what we did, but we, they turned out well. Yeah, outdid <laughs> yourself. Absolutely. Yeah. You know, when we think about medicine, of course, a lot of folks wonder who is capable of talking about medicine because medicine is so broad. You've covered, unlike a s specialist, you may just do one thing. You've had a, had a broad range there during your medical career. Right, Greg. You know, emergency medicine, um, we, we cover the whole waterfront uh, on medicine. We may not go very deeply into any given topic. I mean, I, I can, um, uh, I know a heart attack when I see it, and, right. uh, but I may not know how to take care of heart disease over the long period. But right. um, so we've, we we see the acute phase of virtually everything there is to see. Mm -hmm. um, so it keeps you on your toes. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, even more exciting. Uh, uh, or n another add-on to that was that aspect in the early 90s that you hosted, I believe, a live call-in show, a talk show once a week on Channel 43, this same station, right. before it was yeah. WFXB, WGSE, with Dr. Asbury Williams, right. I believe. Dr. Asbury Williams, family practitioner, Surfside right. for a long time, right. uh, had, a, uh, had a show called You and Your Health, right. uh, and it was live, uh, and it was one hour. And uh, at some point, um, he interviewed me and said, gee, you know, you interview pretty well. Would you like to share the hosting? Um, and so every other week I would do that. And uh, they'd start the cameras rolling. We were live on the air. Uh, and they'd go for 60 minutes. And they'd count down the last 30 seconds. And I had to have my spiel memorized so I could wrap <laughs> it up just at 30 seconds. I love it. And it was a just great fun. Yeah, yeah. Great fun. We never, never had any dull moments where you know we're trying to fill in the. Uh, as a matter of fact, we could have talked for another hour uh, and had more calls for another hour if we'd we'd had it. Oh yeah. yeah. Oh, Lots absolutely. Lots of people called in all the time. That old studio there on Seaboard Street. Oh I yeah. Remember it well. Yeah, and, and, and uh, it was in a kind of a, a storage kind of yeah. building with thin metal walls, and so. Right. Uh, biker Week, uh, all through the interview, you'd hear the Harleys going by. And, um, I remember one uh, interview I did where they were, um, uh, the, the jets from uh, Charleston Air Base were doing practice approaches. Right. And so every five minutes, this roar would come <laughs> about 500 feet over and drown out everything we were saying. It was, uh, it was pretty neat. Absolutely. The, the thrill of live TV, as you know, and of course, even now, anyone can walk in and walk out of here, but they were kind enough to let us in a little before opening up. You had talked about the emergency room, and I think from 89 to the early part of 2000, right. 2002. 2002, yeah. So right. a good 13 or years or so there in the emergency room. You, you segued into a new position there at uh, Grand right. Strand Regional Medical Center in 2002. Right, Greg. The, um, uh, in the early 2000s, the hospital had reached a level of sophistication that um, it was felt that a full-time employed uh, administrator who was also an MD was mm -hmm. needed and um, I'd been around for a while and and um, uh, had been the chief of staff elected chief of staff and so right. I kind of knew uh, the workings and um, my feet were getting sore from 12-hour shifts <laughs> uh, and so it was a very natural thing for me mm -hmm. um, emergency physicians uh, of course, know all the other physicians because we tend to call them up in the right. middle of the night and say, you know, your patient is here. Mm -hmm. uh, so it was, um, it was a good fit. It's been five years, and it's probably taken me that long to figure out how to do the job. <laughs> and it, of course, the opportunity there, as you say, having interfaced with all the doctors throughout right. the hospital in your previous service in the emergency room, and whether, in, and I'm sure even now, in the role of interfacing back with the emergency room doctors as well as all sure. the others, and making yeah. sure there's a good flow of communication between yeah. all the doctors and the administration. That's also opened the door for you to keep in contact with doctors all over the area. Sure. And, uh, and um, we're very lucky at, at, at Grand Strand. We've got a, um, a fine group mm -hmm. uh, of docs who are really intent on doing well. Um, and I don't 
suggest in any other hospital is any less, but right, Grand sure. is the one I know. Absolutely. Yeah. A little more than a year ago, I think I saw that you got active uh, in a, an entirely separate venture, something separate from Grand Strand Me right. Regional Medical Center, and is it Curalase? Curalase, right. Do you it, mind sharing with sure, us a little? Yeah, it's, I think it's an interesting story. Um, back in uh, early um, uh, 2006, uh, a friend of mine, Kenneth Wins, called me. Uh, Ken is uh, an anesthesiologist who specializes in pain. So he had his own private practice, still has his own private practice, where he does epidural steroid injections and, mm -hmm. and treats patients with chronic pain. But um, he called me and he said, John, you know, I'm, I, I have come across something that I think is very, very uh, promising for pain relief. And, mm -hmm. and he and I um, had been singing off the same page with respect to how should doctors approach pain. And it's not, not every doctor approaches pain the same way. And so, mm. um, so he, he thought I was a, a, a natural fit. As it turns out, uh, a fellow named Roger Porter from Loris um, had um, developed a, a laser for pain relief. Roger's not a medical guy, but he's an engineer. He's manufactured several different things, has patents. Um, he'd become interested in this. He had done research, uh, found out that most of the lasers on the market now, the pain relief lasers, were, were um, pretty weak. He found a way to strengthen that laser beam so that it really penetrated deep and, and helped with pain relief. So he manu had it manufactured in Italy, got the patent, got the FDA approval, and uh, he had these nice shiny laser machines for pain relief out in his garage in Loris and didn't have anybody to, to work them. <laughs> so, mm, wow. So he made a cold call on Ken, Ken Wentz, because Ken was a prominent pain guy, and something clicked. A lot of people make cold calls in doctor's offices. Right, and that's sure. Get, get an audience, but uh, for some reason, Ken was ready to try something new. Uh, Roger brought his machine in on a Saturday morning. Ken brought in his five toughest patients, and they all got better that morning. No. Yes. Oh Lord. So, uh, Ken was, uh, and he, Ken was excited, and he still is excited. Uh, he, he um, is passionate about pain relief, and uh, he studies it all the time, and um, he, he still is just bubbling with excitement a year and a half later. Mm -hmm. So it's an interesting thing. It's. Um, it's new, uh, very, uh, it's used fairly heavily in Europe, particularly on uh, athletic teams. Mm -hmm. um, if you went into any Olympic training room, you'd see, you'd see them. You wouldn't see them with the uh, degree of uh, energy delivery that w we have. Mm -hmm. um, and so from there, we developed a practice. We haven't gone out and sold them on the internet or those kind of things. We, re we really wanted to see how well they worked. Mm -hmm. And uh, and so Ken and I each have a clinic. Mine is in uh, in Surfside, and Ken's is up on 82nd Parkway mm -hmm. near the hospital. And um, we are treating patients and and developing the clinical side of this device. Tremendous, tremendous. You know, as we think about, of course, a lot of viewers, myself probably included, would think about lasers for burning and right. cutting things. How right. do lasers work and not burn you? Well, you know, that's the, that's the very common, understandably, the common perception of lasers. Right. You think of this very tiny, thin, pencil beam that's very high energy, and it goes in, and it's such so much energy that it burns. Right. And that's what we do with lasers in surgery. Um, they're so tiny and precise that they can make a little cut more precisely than a surgeon can with a knife. Mm-hmm. 